It's not always easy to tell the good guys from the bad in this show, and that is one of its strengths. But I like the fact that Ryan Pickington is straight up villainous and gives us someone to constantly root against. Hi there mate, how's it going? It's Benji here, and this is a breakdown and review of Line of Duty Season 6, Episode 3. This one kicks off with an interview featuring a woman named Deborah. She claims to have witnessed Terry Boyle arguing with Alistair Oldroyd at a pub on October 26th. Alistair was the informant that started all of this by saying that a man at Beechwood House confessed to Gail Vela's murder. Alistair was killed and so was the man he actually talked to, Carl Banks. The organized crime group got three of these loose ends. But now they have to pin Gail Vela's murder on Terry because they don't want the truth to come out. That's why they sent Deborah to claim that Terry and Alistair were arguing at a pub. This makes it seem like Alistair was talking about Terry when he said someone was bragging about killing Vela. Terry is brought in for another interview and Ryan is accompanying him. He says, quote, You know, I'm still your best mate, Terry. Everything is gonna be fine, as long as you keep your mouth shut. End quote. Well, there it is. It was obvious from previous episodes that the organized crime group were framing Terry, but this quote by Ryan is our proof. Terry doesn't keep his mouth shut in the interview and he says the other man did it. The interview has to be terminated though because Terry gets flustered. We know the other man is Carl Banks but Terry can't get that on record because Joe Davidson shuts down the interview. In my opinion, this action by Joe wasn't too suspicious because she was right. Terry was losing it in there. If this was any other cop, I wouldn't think twice about it. But because it's Joe, I have to. She clearly wanted to prevent Terry from pointing the finger at Carl Banks and in turn the organized crime group. Right after the interview, Joe watches the tape and hears Terry saying it wasn't him and I think that at this point, Joe decides they have to get rid of Terry. Having received his orders, Ryan changes the police car's route and he makes sure they go into a reservoir. I suppose there are more subtle ways to get rid of someone, but Ryan obviously doesn't care about that. The driver manages to get out of the car, but because she can report what Ryan has done, Ryan kills her. And then Terry gets out of the car as well, so yeah, this was a terrible plan by the organized crime group. I mean, literally nobody got stuck in the car as they had planned. Kate had been following the police car so she's able to get there before Ryan can drown Terry, so Ryan has to save Terry. Kate knows there are too many coincidences here like the route change and the fact that Ryan's window was open and this prompts Kate to visit AC-12 because she fears for Terry's life. She knows there must be a leak. I loved watching Hastings here, especially when he first saw Kate because Steve didn't say who he was bringing and Hastings is still upset that Kate has left, so this face was the result. There are not many hilarious moments in this show, but this was one of them for me. Anyways, after hearing her out, Hastings puts a surveillance team on Terry Boyle's approved accommodation. Then Kate and Steve get together, which was a nice moment, it reminded me of the good old days, and Chloe was like all of us, she couldn't look away from this legendary duo. Kate mentions Ryan to Steve and Steve immediately recognizes him from season 1 because Ryan tried to cut his fingers off. We learn that Ryan has been a good boy since his arrest back in season 1 and he was never convicted of anything so that's how he was able to slip through the cracks during the vetting process. Later on, Kate has a chat with Ryan and he lies through his teeth, as always, so there's no surprise there. He doesn't seem too bothered by the driver's death because he can't help it. He doesn't feel sorrow like a normal human being, and he probably doesn't realize that that's awkward and suspicious. We also learn that the driver's autopsy detected broken fingernails and bruising on the back of her neck. Ryan says the crash must have caused those injuries. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you would think that a forensic pathologist would recognize the difference between bruising resulting from a physical struggle with another person and bruising suffered during a car crash. So I hope that's not the end of this matter and that we learn more about the autopsy. This should probably implicate Ryan in the upcoming episodes. If the forensic forensic pathologist isn't bent too. In the meantime, AC-12 find Terry's freezer and detect Jackie Lavery's DNA inside it. The organized crime group hid Lavery's body at Terry's flat for a number of years after she was killed to frame and blackmail Anthony Gates. 
Hastings wonders why Joe didn't think the freezer was important, so Steve and Chloe pay a visit to Farida Jatri in prison. However, they can't talk to her because a bent prison guard breaks Farida's arm and she doesn't want to talk. We remember this guard from season 2, her name is Alison Merchant and she works for the organized crime group. Back then, she warned Lindsay Denton not to talk to AC-12 by pouring boiling water on Denton's hands. Afterwards, Steve talks to Joe about some missing files that point to a burglary at Gail Vela's home when she was murdered. He asks her if she had anything to do with those files going missing, but Joe isn't impressed, she doesn't answer Steve's question. She realizes right here that she has to offer a sacrificial lamb because Farida's intimidation in prison, Terry's police car changing course and then going into the reservoir, these missing files, they all point to someone else other than Farida helping the organized crime group. Joe knows she's AC-12's primary suspect, so she sets up Ian Buckles. The witness from the start of the episode, Debra, turns out to be connected to Ian. She was charged with assault back in 2012, but the proceedings were dropped because of Ian. Kate interprets this as Debra owing Ian a favor, but this is conjecture. The charges could have been dropped for a number of reasons. Nonetheless, Kate and Joe arrest Ian and serve him up to AC-12. Here is my theory on this whole ordeal. Joe felt the heat after Steve's visit and set up Ian. She has already lied about who was responsible for issuing the wrong surveillance authority back in episode 1. She asked for the wrong type but then blamed Ian. So she could be lying about who recruited Ryan too. She said in this episode that it was Ian who recruited Ryan, but maybe Joe recommended him. Also, she could have easily placed the missing Vela files in the boot of Ian's service vehicle. What about the witness, Deborah? Well, we know that the organized crime group sent her and it is entirely reasonable to speculate that they purposefully picked someone connected to Ian. Not only does this protect their real operative Joe, but it also serves up a sacrificial lamb to AC-12. And Ian is the perfect candidate for this. To summarize, I believe that the organized crime group and Joe planned everything to frame Ian. From the recruitment of Ryan to the identity of the witness Debra, they made sure that everything could be tracked back to Ian. And this is pretty much proven at the end of the episode when Joe signs into a message board and notifies an unknown person, possibly the final H, that everything is under control. At first glance, this looks like a neat plan, but it'll probably fall apart like a house of cards in the upcoming few episodes because Kate is gonna keep noticing that something is still off even though the presumed band copper Ian is gone. That's why I fear for Kate's safety, what will happen if she gets too close to the truth while also getting personally involved with Joe. Things are gonna get messy. Let's move on to some other topics, starting with the fact that the police and crime commissioner Rohan Sinvani and Chief Constable Philip Osborne weren't on the best of terms with Gail Vela because she kept grilling them about corruption within the central police. These clips weren't broadcast on television because Vela was basically censored, but they don't appear to be too important. Vela wasn't able to damage Rohan Sinvani's or Philip Osborne's reputations. They were able to censor her, so why would they go after her? Well, these unaired clips are the reason why Vela decided to start her own podcast where she would have full say over her content. She could interview the likes of Jimmy Lakewell who was a solicitor that worked for the organized crime group and it was his voice that we heard on the partial recording in episode 2. And these types of explosive interviews are why the organized crime group went after her and stole all of her files. While these unaired clips don't mean much on their own, they are what kickstarted Vela's obsession and eventually led to her assassination. Hastings is called into Deputy Chief Constable Andrea Wise's office and Rohan Sinwani is there as well. They are mad at Hastings because they told him to conduct a routine performance review of Joe's investigation, but Hastings went ahead and arrested Farida Jatri. I believe that Rohan is only concerned with public perception, he doesn't care that the evidence points to a bent copper and they tell Hastings to drop the fourth H chase because they've concluded there is no institutional corruption within the central police. Rohan wants to uphold the reputation of the central police but he doesn't care if the reputation is true or not. He is a real politician. But we all know Hastings isn't gonna listen to these goons even if it costs him his job. 
Something else that could cost Hastings his job is the fact that he gave Stephanie Corbett £50,000 back in season 5. The organized crime group gave a 100 k to Hastings under false pretenses. He was bamboozled, basically. But he ended up giving half of that money to Steph because he wanted to take care of John Corbett's widow as Hastings was friends with John's mother. Steve keeps going down this rabbit hole in this episode and finds the money in Steph's attic after spending the night at her house. I mean, Steve staying with her was messed up, even though they didn't, you know, do it. But come on. Steve looks at John's picture and goes ahead and enters Steph's room. What the frack, man? Can you please just learn how to keep it in your pants? Anyways, earlier in the episode, Steph talks to Hastings and tells him about Steve's painkiller problem. And soon afterwards, there's a drug test and Steve gets tested. We all know what the result of this test is going to be. Even though Steve tried to stop for a while, his back pain was unbearable. And he went back to using the pills because he is addicted to them. He depends on them to function. It's hard to see where this storyline is going because Hastings knows about Steve's painkiller addiction and in turn Steve knows that Hastings has something to do with Steph's money even though he hasn't figured it all out yet. I think this points to an impending clash between Steve and Hastings but we are probably still a couple of episodes removed from that. All in all, this episode was at least as good as the last one and it was definitely better than the season premiere. I like how they're going all out with Ryan. I mean, he doesn't give a single frack. Seeing Kate back with Steve was nice. Ian Buckles getting framed was an interesting development. And I'm very excited for next week's episode because we could have AC12 interviewing Buckles and Terry Boyle. Ryan's cover could be blown and Steve's drug test result could come back. So I'm expecting an explosive episode episode next week. Until then, keep your eyes peeled for two more Line of Duty videos this week. One of them will be about Ryan Pilkington's character history, which will be out on Wednesday. Well, what did you think about episode 3? Leave your comments down below, like this video if you've enjoyed this breakdown, and subscribe for more movie reviews and TV show breakdowns. That's it for now, take care and see you in the next video.